นโมทัสสะปะโกวะโตระหะโตสัมมาสัมปุตตะสะนโมทัสสะปะโกวะโตระหะโตสัมมาสัมปุตตะสะนโมทัสสะปะโกวะโตระหะโตสัมมาสัมปุตตะสะบุตรธรรมธรรมังสังกังนัมสามิThe Dhamma. <laughs> uh, and it, to a degree, it works in that way, except uh, once you've got over pain in your knees and um, pain in your back and your body settled down and, and things are seemingly quiet and you're not doing very much, then you realize, well, Actually, this just opens up huge cans of worms. Uh, it's all it's all worms, in fact. <laughs> Not much can. <laughs> I'm glad you find that funny. <laughs> yeah, and uh, you know, what are you going to do about that? <laughs> mm. You know, memories, energies, moods, shifts, obsessions, anxieties, feelings of inadequacy, and so on. <clears throat> and in fact, the you know the nat- the if you like the the world around us, you know, and, and the signals we see from the world around us are really get embedded in the world within us. There's not really a lot of separation. You know, you know the world around us with its uh, Its anomalies and distortions and dissonances is being very uh, mirrored by the world within us, if you like to put it like that. The internal and external domains really mirror images of each other. And uh, the big uh, shifts, it seems to me, are in the way we deal with that, the way we approach that dissonance. Yeah. Um, of course, this, if you like, is the essence of the Buddha's teaching. For noble truths, there is dissonance, discord, things not quite working, feeling a bit inadequate or lost or unsettled or you know, disharmonious, you know, however you want to put it. s a d u k k a And uh, this is the kind of keynote in the Buddha's teaching this, pointing to it purely. For the purpose of saying there's nothing wrong with you, particularly personally, <laughs> it's it's a it's a feature uh, of of what we are, need to understand, to reveal, mm, to understand it. Mm. Mm. And saying. Sometimes expression crossing over. Mm. And this is this itself is kind of just a piece of language, you might say. But it's also recognised we don't actually conquer it. We don't cut it out. We don't, you know, we don't push through it. 
there's a, an understanding and a, a release of something so established that we barely recognize it to be a problem. Mm. And this can be encapsulated essentially as our self-structure, our sense of self, our identity packet, mm. which we don't really see as being a problem. I mean, obviously we have find fault with ourselves, but we kind of assume that we just could tidy ourselves up, we'd be a better self. You know? and, and that is really what we also work with in the world around us. If we could sort the world out around us, it would be a better world. And this is a well, you know, reasonable intention, but the way of going around it, we've been doing this for thousands of years. <coughs> it tends to be we try to make things the way we'd like them to be, and that will sort them out. <laughs> you know, I'll get it. It's actually the way I'd like it to be. And so uh, based upon this, this kind of basic uh, understanding or project, we've certainly created a huge havoc in the, on the planet in general. You know, mm. uh, eliminating things we don't like, getting things we do like, protecting ourselves, claiming, owning, conquering. Mm. <clears throat> and we see the results of that, and that becomes more evident uh, in this last generation or so, we've really begun to fathom that. And how do you, and trying to realize, how do you get, how do you, how do you get through this? And this is a, the change of, of intentionality, a change of the way we go about doing things. It's more cooperative, more mutual, more how does the whole thing work, in which perhaps us humans have to learn to let go of a few bits, not exactly have things the way purely for human interest. It's a shared planet, it's a shared territory, it's a shared domain. Yeah. And we share it with other humans, and also we share it with other creatures, and the more fully that understanding can, can be settled upon as for our welfare, the welfare of others, then we feel there's definitely possibilities for major change. And when you consider it just on that external level, it means you know giving up some of the convenient things, recognizing you know some of the convenient things, our plastics, our switch things on power stations, our you know uh, shoot things we don't like <laughs> attitudes uh, that have caused broken up the natural. Uh, cycle of order on the planet whereby nature does look after itself really rather well and we seem to be you know destroying a lot of the natural managers of the planet in terms of the trees and the creatures the insects and the microbes and the fauna that actually make this whole thing work the more we can enter into that you know and realize that what it costs now to do that and to, to realign ourselves. We've got some possibilities. I don't really want to talk about that. I already have done. But, you know, how does this kind of understanding, it's a change of volition. It doesn't mean we're not doing anything at all. It's doing things in a more cooperative, holistic way. You know, not just what I want, but what's What's for the welfare of the whole thing that I'm in, you know, that I'm part of? Yeah. And just that understanding, we are part of air, earth, fire, water, trees, rain, sunshine, oceans, we are part of it. We're not, we are of the planet, we don't own it, we, we're born out of it, and we've got to respect that wholeness. Mm. Yeah. And this changes our volition, our sense of intention, becomes much more listening, learning, pausing on those impulses, pausing on those get it done attitudes, pausing on those straight lines of knock that out, that out, and then it'll be on. Just how do things work? 
How can we cooperate with things we find challenging? You know? So you begin to find, for example, you know, uh, rather than creating, you know, um, canals and um, better to create, uh, create, make rivers more curvy so they will flood. And the flood will then actually um, help to preserve water rather than just flush it all away. So it goes against some of our straight line thinking. Now, if we're looking at that change of volition, and when we come to meditation practice, which we have quite a lot of faith in, this is where you really begin to see working on the microcosm. And the two go together as the external, the internal. And as a certain you know, paradigm shift, and which is extremely significant. And often takes quite a bit of patience and uh, trial and error to, to get right. Yeah. But if we look, for example, as to, to you know, what meditation can be, we have a body and uh, the mind, and the interface between the two, we often think the mind is mostly involved with thoughts, memories, ideas, uh, and so forth, psychological, you know, anxiety, grief, rage, guilt, all this stuff we call this mind and body, you know, it's kind of the bones and flesh and so forth. But if you look at the whole thing as, as a unity, you see, well, the common feature of all of it is energetic. As energies move, like energies move in the body when we breathe, when we move the body around, uh, energies move in the mind when we feel emotions, when we feel great ideas as a surge, uh, we feel challenged, we feel stuck. A lot of energy shift around. When we look at that whole thing, you say, how did you get the energy right? And then you begin to recognize that volition, intention, you do it, you do it thing, that's energy. You know, When you say, oh, you get up, something lights up, doesn't it? I've got a great idea, boom, energy moves. Mentally moves, psychologically moves, physically moves. You see something that attracts you, oh, wow, it looks good. Energy moves, doesn't it? That movement of energy, right? heart energy, brain energy, body energy, that's what intention's about. It's not, I have an idea in my head that I'm planning on. Intention means this shift of energy whereby something Energy moves in a particular direction. Yeah? You know? So if we have a plan, all right, oh yeah, that's a good idea. You can feel it. Now, of course, we tend to not notice it because we get involved with the idea. What a great idea, what a great idea. And then I'll do this and I'll do that. And then this and then that. And I can't, how do I get over that? What happens if that goes wrong? How am I going to fix that? And then I'll make that. And we get very much involved in the the ideas, but actually, for a meditator, yeah, maybe so. Maybe so. That's all abstract. The way things could be, should be, will be, won't be, that's, oh, that's abstract. What's directly experienced is that rush to get the answer, to get the solution, to get things fixed, to get things sorted. That movement. Think, wait a minute. Wait a minute. It's just, just what's happening in the whole system. Can you keep the whole system in mind? Oh well, yeah, there's a body here. All right, yeah. And relaxing the body, steadying the body. Energy steadies. Maybe it gives a chance to dislodge the compulsive nature of the thinking mind. So use your body energy as a kind of counterbalance to that tremendous propelling quality of thinking which we can do yeah. and thinking its duty if you like is to keep moving yeah. that's what it does it's good at that it can jump around that's where it really gets lively and interesting you take a thought and just hold it still you can't you have to think it and think it again, and think it again, and think it. So, 
and it kind of loses its it loses its its feeling. It loses its pizzazz. It's only it's only kind of interesting and gripping when it moves. It's that energy, that the rush of energy or the particular form of it. That's what makes it so compulsive and compelling and attractive. Mm. Oh, well, I've got a great idea. They get high on that. And often we can get pretty intoxicated with it. If you ever find like two two great scholars having a debate, they can get quite vicious. <laughs> you know, and say all kind of ter- ter- terrible things to each other because they're so intoxicated with the argument. You, know, you idiot. Da, 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 da. Uh, the, the nature of the thinking mind gets ex- extremely insensitive and to other other people's opinions. We get we can get very intoxicated with it, and you can see scholars, but you also see dogmatism, fundamentalism, politics. They're all based upon whipping up that energy with all slogans that get you fired up. So you rush in, you don't really think things through clearly. You don't look at the nature of the speaker. Do you trust that person? No, you get the slogan, the idea, the promise, and the quick speak, and it's like a magic trick. And people buy it, fall for it. Because the energy rushes. We love it. We feel convinced. Hmm. Where does that go? Generally goes towards narrow-mindedness, impulsiveness, uh, missing something out. Missing something out. Mm. Missing out dispassion, missing out openness, missing out the attentive, receptive quality of energy when it's steady, listening, attentive. Quite beautiful doesn't have to go anywhere, can settle down, comfortable, refreshing. And so when we meditate, one of our aims is to just get hold of that thinking mind and even sometimes just thinking the same word over and over again using a mantra or moving your attention around the body, just to change the gear so it comes down a notch, down a notch. Not out of aversion, but just to moderate that. Uh, and know you can do that. And so your intention then shifts from following the thought or fighting with the thought to handling the energy of it. And just, what's it like to take that thought, listen to it carefully, and using attentiveness to your breathing or your body, just to breathe out long on a thought. Just to span that thought with a thought with a breath. Extend it, breathe it out, and wait. And see if there's a need to keep thinking. If there is, breathing in, take it steady. Smooth it, calm it, steady it. Is there a need to keep thinking? Maybe there is. Calm it, steady it. So it becomes much more careful. And in that naturally, one of the amazing things is wisdom happens by itself, out of out of the non-thought. That's called realization, that the wisdom, the understanding that comes out of the non-thought. And when you're thinking something, then you get a bit quieter about that, and then you realize. I'm just getting hung up about something. There's no need to get hung up about. What are we doing that for? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, because it takes us into, when we be able to steady thought a little bit, it takes us much more into the heart. And heart, yeah, that's just the word, but it doesn't just mean a... a, a 
in emotional medium, it means something that's intuitive, receptive, non-conceptual. It says, you just need to take it steady. These quiet intuitions come out of the non-thought. If we've moderated it. This is part of the skill. Is to have that faith. That if we begin to challenge the thinking mind, or the aiming mind, with its impetus to get things Fix to stop doing that to make things better to solve come up with a problem an answer, you know, to get things going the way I'd like them to be. If we can challenge some of that, maybe we'll get another perspective that's actually much more holistic, much more all encompassing, where you, the heart is peaceful with that. Hmm? Because we do recognize that uh, in many of the uh, big discords of our life, thinking doesn't serve us very well at all. Okay, so here's the big one, death. Think your way out of that one. Bereavement. Mm. uh, You know, don't think about it. Well, true enough, and yet, what happens when it lands right in front of us? What happens when something breaks down right in front of right in front of us? What happens if our friend, our wife, our husband, our dad, our son breaks down in front of us? What happens? I mean, either dies or is extremely sick or has a psychotic episode or is, loses control of himself. Or something. What do you do? Are you thinking. Just get, hmm? No. <laughs> doesn't mean don't think, it means you've got to stop that because the thinking will only come up with all kinds of um, strategies to make it change, to make it not happen, to make it otherwise. And <laughs> there are certain things that are never going to be otherwise. You know, death is never going to be other. It's never going to be happy, comfortable. It's never going to be like that. Uh, and this, so, it's not going to. Ch- we have to change. We have to change. And this is, of course, one of the great teachings and the great reasons why the Buddha recommended we do contemplate our aging, our breaking up of our body and our death, and also that of people around us. You meet it. You don't fix it. You don't have a plan to stop it happening. You don't blame it. You meet it. And this is a very easy uh, way of getting hold of you know, the challenge of dukkha which is the most, that's the most obvious one the Buddha talked about, is sickness, death. You, know, you, you want it not to happen. It's going to happen. Whose fault is it? How can you stop? Like, you know, it's, <laughs> I remember talking to a very um, good long-term friend, I'm sure you, um, many of you know him, Steve Saslav, he used to be Ajahn Santachitto, for, who was over 20 years as a monk, and he disrobed and he worked in hospices. So he got a good look at, at death and uh, inevitability and the handling of it and the meeting of it and the non-curing of it. And then he got cancer, which went terminal. And I was talking to him about it and he said, ah, uh, the important thing is to don't miss the occasion that cancer offers you. To really don't miss the occasion that cancer offers to you. He said, if I hadn't trained for all these years in monastic training, I'd, I might have missed this. Don't, but you, you must you make, use the occasion that cancer offers you. 
and he, he stayed with that. And as his disease, his cancer progressed, his, um, what he would say would get simpler and simpler until he was right on his own, his last words as he was passing away was just love, gratitude, love, gratitude. That's nothing else to say, <laughs> you know. Yeah, he used the occasion wisely. Now, I, I, do, I could imagine that most of us here would think, oh no, cancer's an enemy. Cancer's vile, cancer's brutal, cancer destroys people. You know, someone who got cancer at the age of 40, create a long life. People get cancer at the age of teens, you know, taken away, destroyed, an enemy, nasty thing. How can we cure it? Yeah, I, can, I could go for that and I can understand that. What happens when it doesn't? Do we continue to make it an enemy? How useful is that? Do we make death an enemy, a tragedy? How useful is that? Hmm? Perhaps it's an occasion. Hmm? And what is that occasion? Well, Steve said, love. What do you mean? You like cancer? <laughs> no. What do you mean? You 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 think it's you? What are you talking about? It means. You let go of the recriminations. You let go of the why me. You let go of the me and mine. You open into something else, which is more universal than the me mine. You know, the heart opens, and the open heart is beautiful. It's a, it is a, a treasure. It is the treasure. The heart with no regret, no boundaries, is the treasure. And if you have to think why, you haven't got it. <laughs> and this, if you might say, put it more in conventional Buddhist terms, this is the result of letting go. This is the ending of a kind of uh, a quality that we perhaps don't necessarily recognize, thirst, craving for existence, craving to be something, craving to be me. So built in, I don't really know, I might crave for peanut butter or, you know, a day on the beach, but I don't crave to be me, do I? It's kind of, it's subliminal. But actually, every other form of, of craving is based upon it. Yeah. May I get my way. May I have what I want. Uh, may I achieve my wishes. And I, may I, all that. Who are we talking about? <coughs> Who are we talking about? Who is that? <coughs> One of those Zen questions, isn't it? It's not a question you answer, it's a question you roll over and think, yeah, good point. There's a lot of, most of it is volition. Most of it is, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that, I want to be this, I can't stand that, I'm not having any of that, I want that, you know. Most of it's that, isn't it? Most of the me bit is aiming for something. And the other bit is being affected by things. And the two go together, are affected, and then there's that impulse. Yes, that's me. Now what if the basis for how I'm affected, instead of does this feel nice or not, is does this bring forth the best in me or not? It's, so we're not kind of discounting the fact that we, are, we exist on some level, you know, we're certainly here, but instead of, you know, what do I like, or want, or what brings forth the best in me? 
Interesting. What brings forth a possibility for greater? And then if you ask that question, you don't come up with things like uh, generosity, patience, honesty, uh, forgiveness, uh, courage. You know, they just pop up. Because something knows this is your this is the best in you. And you can't buy it, and nobody can sell it to you, and nobody can create it for you. And you can't get it from anyone else. It's utterly your own. It's utterly your treasure. And it is often most fully and deeply realized as we put aside immediate getting what I want. Getting what I, going my way. So certainly in you know my my monastic training, I've kind of over years of it. it uh, that's that's what that's what comes around. It's a change of people say, "What would you like?" I kind of feel can't really get it. What do you want? I don't really know quite where to put the question. I can't really find an answer for it because it all sounds a bit... But I know what brings forth the best is when I have to meet and rise up and bring forth. And it's not about conquering dukkha. It's about the occasion, that dissonance, uncertainty, insecurity, things going wacky, brings up. Possibly things are going to be upside down, topsy-turvy, lost, confused. Time to wait, be patient, open up that door. Things going upside down, time to open up the equanimity door. Yeah. And I don't see this as a thought process, it's more instinctive. <clears throat> and it does bring forth in quite marvellous ways. Yeah, I had a bit of an e- e- episode the other day when I was uh, trying to catch a train, which was a little, I had to change trains at Clapham Junction, which is a huge junction as you probably all know I know how many 20 or 30 platforms in it so I got my train came down from um, Berkhamsted I was staying at Amarwadi and it gets me to Clapham Junction it's about supposed to be a nine minute gap between one train and the next well my train was about four minutes late so I got five minutes not nine a little bit of mm -hmm, mm -hmm, you know get off the train where's my train to Honiton I don't know, start looking around, aware of the click, 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 tick, tick, seconds disappearing. Finally, look on the platform, on it, and platform nine, okay, right, mindful. Mindfully strides up the stairs, a little bit, you know, vigorously mindful. <laughs> Get across the footbridge, okay, here we are, there's platform nine, platform nine. Get down there, there's a train sitting there, and let's see which train I need to catch. Look at the notice for it, it says first train, train to Honiton. Okay, so first train that comes in will be the train to Honiton. So that train pulls out, sign changes, first train, Portsmouth. Ah, that was the Honiton train. <laughs> it's, just part, it's just pulled out. I have just missed, mindfully missed the train. <laughs> I have no money. <laughs> I have this ticket, which is non-transferable. <laughs> ah, time for some. The, and the funny thing is, it's, I don't even think it anymore. Just as soon as those points of happen, something just stops. It stops, opens. Actually, Clapham Junction. It's all right being here. Nobody's shooting me, I'm okay. Something will happen. I've this ticket in my hand, looking in, the guard, 
I said, well, I've just missed my train, I said. <laughs> she looks, I can't, she looks it. Don't worry, she says. <laughs> we'll sort something out. <laughs> Goes off. Five minutes later, comes down with a little voucher. Mm. Little voucher says, Miss train due to wrong information, does not have funds to buy a new ticket. Here you go. Gives me his voucher. Say, oh, human beings, I love them. <laughs> <laughs> when human beings are really being human, not, oh, I'm sorry, that's the system. You missed the train, you know, duh, 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 you know, human beings. And how often we've kind of given that humanness over to some system to organize us. <laughs> Yeah, and it organizes into these very rigid, uh, inhuman patterns, doesn't it? You know, we believe, we bow to the system, we look for the system, what's the right system? You know, what's the right meditation system? Am I doing right? Am I got to stage three in the meditation system? System, system, system. And it doesn't bring out the best in you. <laughs> doesn't bring out the best in you. Just makes you feel secure. But it's an illusion. It's an illusion. Coming down from London, coming down from Scotland, got my ticket, transfer to the underground, get my ticket, stick it in the in the machine. Machine doesn't op- doesn't cooperate. Do it again. Machine gate doesn't open. Do it again. Gate doesn't open. Stand there, ticket, waiting. Somebody comes along with an oyster car. There you go. You know, human beings, systems, that's what systems do for you. Yeah? And you're like, kind of, oh, I've got to get, I've got to get, I've got I, 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 my train, I've got to get, i got to get, no, no, I've got to get the train, my time's, I've got to get the train. It doesn't matter, you flap, you're flapping up and down, jumping up and down, getting panic. he's not going to open that gate. <laughs> so you just stand and relax. Breathe out. Maybe that's it, then. Things, you give room for miracles to happen. Hmm? We give room for miracles to happen. And the <laughs> beauty of the realization is life is a miracle. We never were in control of it. We never invented it. We didn't create this earth. We didn't create this body. We didn't create anything. We didn't own it. We didn't create it. It's a miracle. It's a gift. Can you just open to that? Let go of some of the pushy volition, making things work, and da 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 da. Just it's it's definitely an edge there. We don't like it. We don't like it. It makes us feel insecure, uncertain, hopeless. We just relax, surrender and see what comes up hmm? out of that. And yeah, <clears throat> so we come to just the most basic meditation, you know, where's the me in that? Where's the me in breathing? Where's the meditator in, the, in breathing? And if you practice, you realize eventually the breathing's fine, it's the meditator that's the problem. That's why you can't do it. Because there's a meditator sitting in your mind trying to do it. That's why you can't do it. Or sometimes you can do it, and that's even worse. (laughs) (laughs) Because you don't actually get the point of something has to open and let go to a different kind of energy, a different kind of miracle, and a different kind of Volition. It's a stra- It's a movement of the heart. A movement of the heart, which is not originating from this me position. Right? <clears throat> when the Buddha 
taught is that you know you you must start practice get into this you start touching first through into mutuality the first teaching is generosity mm. so everybody can do that everybody feels good doing it and we just give somebody a hand it doesn't have to be just the, the act of giving you know, because it's, it it feels good and it's also brings up the bestness we learn to share cooperate learn from each other you know it, it, it creates us it makes us into something a lot bigger than we were when we were just holding and having and taking good you get that so then you cultivate morality which gives a little crisper firmer basis like a moral court moral compass to others as to myself mm. Yeah, so again, it's a mutual thing, isn't it? To others as to myself. I don't do that to you. I could, but I'm not going to. I could push you around or dominate you or you know, manipulate me. I don't want to do that. I want to instead enter into harmony with you. And that's going to be it's often a bit of a struggle, but we can work it out. And look, so this is where we get this kind of non-sentimental love if you like is mutual respect and empathy it's not sentimental it's not romantic it's exceptionally valuable a treasure we can do it so we need to get that one going then you begin to recognize you know how do people lose sight of this because of the fevers that arise in terms of gratification they get obsessive they get fixated they get mesmerized by sensuality, status, power, prestige, domination, getting on top, conquering. You get mesmerized by that. You can see, yep, that's true. You look around the world, a lot of mesmerized tyrants. Yeah. And where's it? So you think, this is not just one bad person. This is definitely a human problem. So, then, okay. Renunciation. I've got to learn to go the other way. Let go. Let go. Let go. Yeah. Renounce things. Let go of some of the baubles, some of the glories, some of the status, some of the power, some of the prestige. Can I do that? Yeah. Yes, I can. Something in me feel, doesn't want to do that, maybe, but can. If there's a sense of something grander or more beautiful that can arise and so we have to practice with that it's definitely an act of faith this is what we mean going forth really means this whether you're a monk nun or lay person whatever you whatever you consider yourself to be going forth is is this particular move uh, a very valuable one and an and essential he so says, the Buddha says, if you can do this, then you're ready. Then you're ready to <coughs> penetrate what I'm talking about. You've learned that particular gear shift away from the volition that pushes forward into a volition that acknowledges, steps back, opens up what brings forward the best for all of us. You know? And then you can take that internally. You know? I guess like most people, I get anxious, um, I get nervous, I feel inadequate, you know, times. I feel very challenged by what I see in the world around me. I feel depressed by it. Mm -hmm. And I can think, oh, you know, pull yourself together, it's all just impermanent. <laughs> or something like that. No, no I'm not, not doing that anymore. <laughs> That's just a sort of strategizing. I'll feel it instead and not make an enemy out of it. Not make it a problem. Not make it something that's going wrong with me. Yes, that's what it feels like. That's what it feels like. I don't like it. I don't want it. That's what it feels like. How do I make my sadness, and my anxiety, it not, how do I convert it from being an enemy into being an ally. Love. 
you could say. There's compassion, there's a, a recognition, this is common ground for all of us. This is where I'm not so grand and magnificent. That's fine, I can be with that. This is where I don't have the nice answers. Okay, I can be with that. This is where I have to really open very wide uh, to how things are. And feel those emotions in my body. Stand, sit, open, stand tall, sit tall, open up, breathe, let it move through. And the craving to have it all fixed, sorted, worked out according to some doctrine, cosmology, pattern, just forget it. And then, but <laughs> there is a volition that arises from that. Yeah. What's that? Love, you could say. It's not sentimental, it's not romantic, it's certainly not erotic. It's embracing, it's caring, it's compassionate, it's attuned to the welfare of beings. I think this is what the Buddha was doing for his lifetime, why he kept going after his own realizations. Wasn't that what he kept going with? Mm -hmm. For the welfare of others. And certainly, I imagine, or how can I say, but it wasn't an easy ride. Constantly meeting challenges all the time. And yet, exercising, perfecting that immaculate space that opens when you've perfected that skill of not fighting suffering, but deeply penetrating understanding and removing the craving for perfection, the craving for answers, the craving to be and become, releasing that. What amazing quality is present? And the Buddha demonstrated this. He says, my chitta has no boundaries. It's unrestricted. My chitta is unrestricted by birth, Aging, sickness, death. My jitter is not restricted by defilement. My jitter is not defi- restricted by perception, feeling, form, volition, consciousness. My jitta is not restricted by suffering. This is the jitta of the Tathagata. It is released. Uh, not restricted by it. It says, I see suffering. I'm aware of suffering. I'm not restricted by it. You think, just contemplate. What do you think that means? What, what it doesn't mean, hmm? Buddha certainly died, you could say a rather miserable, ignominious death. He wasn't bothered. Dying under a tree with his colic or whatever, you know, degenerated sickness, he wasn't bothered by it. He could certainly feel it. Chitta was not restricted by it. And from that, still saying, please, questions, anybody, questions? I mean, that's a great way to go, isn't it? (laughs) The last act on earth is, anybody want a hand? (laughs) That's pretty, I mean, that's that's pretty grand, in my opinion. (laughs) So, because that that sense of hanging on, to me, is, is finished. So we contemplate and we train ourselves. You'll meet the suffering of things not working, people not turning up on time, you know, things breaking down, things being unsteady, you know, people making mistakes, so forth. You're going to meet that. This is just the minor stuff, the minor grind. <laughs> and you always bear that in mind. It's like that's that particular nerve that's pushing. This is the one, you know, that we can kind of Da, here's fault, da, fix that. Until you're going to come to this granddad, which is called aging, sickness, and death, and that one you're not going to, 
you're not going to get over. <laughs> so use this stuff to learn to, okay, let's not get panicky, okay, let's not sw- you start calling each other names, just chill, relax, get into your body, relax, open the heart. Everybody gets flustered, everybody gets scrambled, everybody gets irritated. And there it goes. Now what comes forth? This is the way. This is the way that streams out of that letting go. The the Eightfold Path comes out of that process, leads into it and comes out of it. So this is my encouragement for the evening, but um, you, know, you know, if you want to get it down to a little nugget, just, just learning to really train and cultivate the deep relaxation of your body. That helps to cultivate the deep release of the heart's energies. And when those heart's energies are no longer constricted, they will stand up for you. And they will take you places that your thinking mind and your aims and intentions can't go. And you'll get to the end of suffering. This is the Buddha's uh, promise. So offer this for your reflection.